Muy buenos días desde España. A very good morning to you from Spain. It is my pleasure to be participating in this seventh International English Online Conference because there is no invitation which I accept more gladly, ni con más ilusión, than one which comes from my admired professor Jaime Ancajima. Now, I know Jaime has a huge and very international fan club, but I assure you I could very well be its president because I am a great admirer of the amazing work he does, which is a true inspiration to us all. So thank you so much for having me. It is both an academic honor and a personal privilege to be with you all today. The agenda for this plenary talk is to focus on two very hot topics right now, Khalil and diversity, to see how in conflation, we can bring well-being into our classrooms. So I will be focusing on uh, key terms like the ones that you have on screen and which are increasingly present in our bilingual program since they are uh, more and more diversity sensitive, both in Europe in general and in Spain in particular. And this is also reaching Latin America because in Brazil, for example, now CLIL is also increasingly being uh, mainstreamed in public schools. So this entails not only a huge challenge and an increased difficulty, but according to some experts, it could actually undermine or jeopardize everything we have achieved so far in bilingual education. As one teacher we polled said, El bilingüismo murió cuando fue para todo el mundo. So to ensure that we keep bilingual education very much alive, today I would like to address three overarching objectives with you. First, I'd like to offer you the latest empirical evidence in order to answer the most frequently asked questions pertaining to diversity in CLIL. I'd also like to share with you practical tips for methodology evaluation and materials design on this front. And all in all, to provide lots of food for thought on how we can promote well being in our classrooms through diversity and inclusion in CLIL. And in doing so, and by way of introduction, I would like to underscore that I'm a firm believer in learning from the best practices of others. So I want to share with you our journey with Khalil in this sense in Spain, so that you can learn from the lessons we have gleaned and not make our same mistakes. <laughs> and as we say here in Spain, Spain is different. This is a sort of slogan that we have for tourism, but which I also think beautifully applies to CLIL because we're different on the upside due to the fact that we currently have one of the most diversity sensitive bilingual education systems in the whole of Europe, which is very positive, although also quite challenging. But on the downside, we're also unique through what I call El fenomeno del cuñadismo. Now, in English, this would be something like brother in lawism. I don't know if this applies to the countries where you're all listening from, but here in Spain, we have this. Well, I don't know if it's an urban legend or a hard and fast fact that our cuñados, our brothers in law, they know about everything, right? It doesn't matter what topic you bring up over Christmas dinner, they know about it and they have an opinion which they firmly believe is the right one. Now, of course, this has a scientific name. It's called the Dune Kruger effect. Uh, it basically refers to the fact that the less one knows about something, the more one thinks one knows. And this is kind of dangerous, right? Because this is happening also with CLIL. So people who haven't read on CLIL or uh, researched on it or even implemented it are uh, throwing out their uh, unsubstantiated opinions. And this is leading to a series of false myths or misapprehensions or misconceptions as they're termed, which are actually plaguing bilingual education. You know, we're used to these fake news, right? On other fronts, for example, with COVID, we've had lots of fake news with COVID. Remember Trump saying that we should inject bleach in order to clean our lungs or la gotica milagrosa de Maduro? Or here in Spain, this is a very Spanish one, we also saw news that said, don't worry about the virus, just drink alcohol, it'll kill it off. Not true. 
the same is happening with Khalil, right? And uh, we he, here in Spain, we've got a lot of false myths being spurred on through newspaper articles, blog posts, um, social media tweets. Even it's even on the on TV on the news, right? This little snippet uh, became viral just a few weeks ago, and it again spoke of the segregation inherent in Khalil. So we have a sort of a uh, set of false myths which are affecting and impacting Khalil. And just like there's a top 10 for Netflix, I think there's a top 10 for false myths and elitism is right up there at the top. Yeah, because there's a real plethora of accusations besetting Khalil in terms of elitism. I could bring you a million quotes, you know, it's considered una pesadilla elitista. Eh, en el AICLE, en la educación bilingüe, hay un clasismo brutal, es una excusa para la segregación. Is this true? Well, this is exactly what I would like to approach with you today by addressing eight sub objectives. First, I would like you to leave this plenary by having a clear cut concept of diversity, which is the very basis of everything that we'll be mentioning today. I would also like to equip you, as I mentioned previously, with the latest robust empirical evidence that you are equipped to answer the haters. Um, I'd also like to offer clear-cut pedagogical and evaluation techniques to cater for diversity so that we can learn from the best practices of others, especially right now at European level. I will also stop a moment to furnish guidelines for adequate materials design to cater for diversity, which is one of the greatest challenges we have right now in the field. And all in all, I'd like to acquaint you with the top challenges we have ahead, and obviously uh, with how to face up to them and provide lots of food for thought in order to follow possible lines of action to promote well-being in our classrooms with all types of students. So how exactly am I going to do this? Well, we're going to do this by playing a game, the game of 20 questions. Have you heard about it? You basically have 20 questions that you can pose in order to guess a person or an event or a thing. Yeah. So for example, for example, if I ask you, is it organized by the great Jaime and Kajima? Is it an awesome yearly conference? Does it bring teachers together from all over the world? Does it have the best audience? You will immediately know that I am referring to, of course, none other than the seventh international English online conference. So we're gonna do just this but we're gonna flip it around, right? We're gonna depart from diversity, inclusion, and elitism and CLIL, and then we're gonna ask 20 questions. Well, actually, we're only gonna have time for 15, okay? But they're gonna be the 15 most frequently asked questions right now pertaining to this issue in bilingual education. So um, after this initial backdrop, I'm gonna jump right in to these 15 questions. And for each one, I'm gonna be doing three things, okay? First, obviously, hopefully, I'm gonna be answering the question. I'll also, for each one, showcase the main lesson we have learned, and I'll also seize the opportunity to include what I call real English expressions, because I don't know over there, but over here, we find that our CLIL teachers normally have a stilted, obsolete, textbookish kind of English, which is like 19th century-ish, which we need to refresh and update through what I call real English, right? The English that is currently used in, in real classrooms in native speaking countries. Um, and real English changes extremely quickly, right? For you, get, for you to get a feel, um, um, for example, to say something like wonderful, genial, in the 50s, if you watch a Cary Grant movie, you would hear swell. In the 80s, when I was studying at the American School of The Hague, we were all going around saying, oh my God, that's so radical from rad. Um, excellent was popularized by Hugh Grant in British English in the 90s. And now people are saying something like, oh my God, that's so awesome, or that's sick, that's dope. If something is sick, it's really cool. Or well, according to my nieces, who are my greatest source of real English, right now people are saying lit. If something is really lit, it's really cool. In fact, a lituation is a really cool situation. So you see how quickly this changes and the same happens for the classroom. So it's incumbent upon us to be up to date with this real English to overcome what I call the it's raining cats and dogs syndrome that is wasting our precious time teaching and learning expressions 
that nobody ever uses. Yeah. So I'm going to be throwing in real English expressions. And every time one of them appears, I'll be circling it in red. Okay. So that we can kill two birds with one stone. And finally, I'll wrap it up by extracting the broader takeaways for you. Okay. So sound good. Yeah. You ready? Okay, well, let's hit it then. Let's jump right into our 15 questions. Here they are. We're going to be taking them one by one. So let's jump right into the fray, real English expression, as we say in Spain, vamos al lío. Yeah. Um, let's depart from the very first question we need to ask, which is what exactly do we understand by diversity? Because, you know, um, we tend to associate diversity with special education needs, yeah, with learners who have severe learning difficulties. But now that we are mainstreaming CLIL for everyone, the notion of diversity needs to transcend mere special education needs, right? So in this sense, we have designed a theoretical framework, we call it the DD framework, which goes one step beyond. And it also bears in mind different styles, levels, paces, and cultural backgrounds. It's called DD because it capitalizes on the concepts of diversity, inclusion, differentiation, and integration. Diversity uh, entails providing an adequate education to all students, and it rests, it's sustained by the pillars of inclusion and differentiation. Inclusion also aims to respond to the learning needs of all students from an asset-based perspective, viewing diversity as an opportunity for enrichment and to help learners go from being outsiders to becoming participants. And differentiation targets students with diverse abilities and backgrounds, especially in terms of Vygotsky's zone of proximal development and in line with multiple intelligence theory. And then a conflation of these three aspects leads to the integration of students with diverse ability levels. And all four concepts dovetail to um, safeguard equitable access to cool programs and to offset the disenfranchisement of the most vulnerable and underserved learners. Now, if uh, any of you uh, is interested, um, this framework that we have um, designed um, and which goes beyond mere special education needs is available in an article that is in press with the International Journal of Bilingual Education within a special issue entitled Cool for All. So just shoot me an email and I'll be happy to share. So bottom line, we now have a framework on which to sustain the concept of diversity. Um, second question, which I have to confess, I get a lot, yeah? Um, a lot of people ask me in all the conferences that I've been giving this year, Marisa, are critics right to question inclusion policies and practice in bilingual programs? Now, um, when we started out with CLIL back in the late 1990s, I think the answer to this, que to this question would probably lean towards a yes, because there was overt streaming in many countries, right? Learners who wanted to partake in a CLIL program either had to accredit a certain subject knowledge or a language level or both. And in countries like Spain, where there were no admission criteria, there was covert streaming through what Lorenzo et al. terms self-selection in terms of social class or parental choice. So in schools, we would have two coexisting streams, CLIL and non-CLIL. And the best learners, the most intelligent, the most motivated, the most linguistically proficient, would probably go into the CLIL stream. So um, to top it all off, as we say in real English, to add insult to injury, el colmo de los colmos, as we say here in Spain, in addition, homogeneity between the CLIL and, and non-CLIL groups was not guaranteed in the studies carried out. There was a lack of materials, very vague pedagogical and evaluation orientations, teacher training needs were high, and satisfaction with, with support systems was low. So you know what? Yes, critics were right to question these policies because the lesson learned here is that CLIL was elitist in the past. But what's the story now, 20 years after CLIL implementation? As we say in real English, what's the sitch? What's the situation? In order to answer this question, 
we would need to break it down into three sub questions, which are the ones that you have on screen. First, are the best students still in the cool groups? Second, what's the possible differential effect exerted by variables that we normally associate to elitism? And third, can CLIL work anywhere, even in the most disenfranchised settings? Let's take a look at them one by one first. Are the best students still in the CLIL groups? Well, we've got a robust and very recent evidence base tapping into this issue, which has compared CLIL and non-CLIL groups in hundreds of randomly selected schools in terms of verbal intelligence, motivation, and English grade, and look at the results. No statistically significant differences have transpired between the groups. So no, the best students are no longer in the CLIL groups, or to put it another way, CLIL and non-CLIL groups are increasingly homogeneous. Second, what's the possible differential status uh, sorry, differential effect of variables like socioeconomic status, setting, or type of school. Well, um, there have been, again, very recent studies exploring this issue, and they have compared bilingual and non-bilingual students in rural and urban contexts, in low, medium, and high socioeconomic status, normally taking the parents' educational level as a proxy and in private, public, and charter schools, what we call centros concertados here in Spain. And surprise, surprise, the best results have been found for the urban, high socioeconomic status private school students. But, but, this has only been the case for the non-bilingual learners. In the bilingual groups, CLIL programs are canceling out these differences. And this finding has come across in repeatedly in all the studies carried out from 2017 until 2021. And in fact, there are now studies, very recent ones, exploring why this is the case. They've been spearheaded by Anna Halbeck at the University of Alcala. And they found that this is due to three main reasons. First, because CLIL students have a sense of group belongingness that makes them meet more responsible. Second, because they're more used to not having their parents be able to help them with homework, so they're more autonomous. And third, teachers are aware of the increased cognitive challenge inherent in CLIL, so they provide more language sensitive teaching, which uh, makes CLIL accessible to everyone. So bottom line, CLIL is acting as a leveler across settings and contexts, which is an extremely positive tendency that we're going to have to continue to keep our eye on. And the third question that I had here, does CLIL have the potential to work even in the most disenfranchised settings? For example, in a public rural high school in a teeny tiny town with uh, uh, parents who have a low socioeconomic status, with a majority of gypsy ethnicity. This is the case of uh, the high school Montes Orientales in Iznayos, which is a small town in Granada in the south of Spain where I live. And uh, here we went in and we compared perfectly homogeneous CLIL and non-CLIL students, and the CLIL learners were better across the board. We found CLIL was working magnificently. If you ask me why, I think it was probably due to the, the teachers. They had a teaching team with a C2 English level, extremely committed to the CLIL enterprise and very well versed in bilingual education. And, you know, these kids, they, they blew me away. I mean, they were speaking English in the hallways. They followed very complex content teaching in English. They carried out very sophisticated projects in the target language. And in fact, when I was approached by Historias de Luz, to tape a mini documentary on our project. And they said, Marisa, where do you want to record it? I said, in Iznadios, so that everyone can see that these uh, children who would otherwise never have had the opportunity to learn languages bilingually are thriving in a CLIL scenario. And you know what? I always also share a personal anecdote on this front. I know it's not scientific or you know generalizable, but it's very illustrative. Um, as I said before, I live in Granada, and before the pandemic hit, I used to go to the gym, and my gym is in La Chana, which is a socioeconomically dodgy area in Granada. And right next to it, there's a public bilingual high school. And before pandemic, 
I stopped to take a picture because you know how teenagers will write graffiti saying, Maria, te quiero? Well, it was in English, in Latana, right? So these kids are declaring love for each other in English. So yeah, absolutely. Clil can work even in Isnayos, even in Latana, provided that it's carried out adequately. So the lessons learned here is um, involve, as Javier Gisbert has put it, that bilingual education is offering everyone what was previously reserved for the elites, yeah? So um, right now, Clil cannot be considered elitist. But um, what about the future? Now that CLIL is being mainstreamed school-wide, right? CLIL is for everyone. What are the main challenges that we're up against in CLIL programs? Well, we have very fresh research evidence stemming from the um, Adibe Research Project, which has found, in fact, we presented, by the way, the results like three weeks ago, so it's that fresh. Um, and these outcomes have found that um, with the current model, CLIL is not working, right? Mainstreaming is not only a huge challenge, it could jeopardize everything we have achieved so far due to several main reasons. First, because we lacked a clear cut framework that we luckily now have through DD. Um, secondly, and I think this is the top challenge right now, teachers feel greatly daunted by the lack of materials to cater for diversity. They have to find them, adapt them, or design them themselves. And this is a huge challenge for them. There are also very vague pedagogical and evaluation orientations to accommodate differentiation in clear classrooms. Teacher training needs are high across the board, especially on three fronts, materials, scaffolding, and student-centered methodologies, which are precisely the three techniques that teachers tend to resort to most. So it's as if they wanna fine tune and hone to perfection what they're already using. And finally, there is a very lukewarm satisfaction with the support systems that have been set in place to cater for diversity, especially in terms of teacher-student ratios, time to collaborate and coordinate with other colleagues, and the support um, received from language assistance. So, we need to rethink, re-engineer uh, what we're doing. Um, we need to, you know, plus it up, as we say in real English. We need to, I guess, subir de nivel, right? We need to course correct if we want to ensure that CLIL stays on track. But we're not here to dwell on the challenges, right? We're here to provide solutions. So what are we doing about all this? Um, as I mentioned previously, through the overarching Adibe umbrella, which encompasses four projects at all levels, European, national, regional, and local, we're already working on all these challenging fronts. We have, first of all, as I mentioned previously, designed the DD framework. So we do have a theoretical backdrop now, which transcends mere special education needs. Secondly, from a quantitative perspective, we're in the process of determining the impact of CLIL on L1, L2, and content learning uh, with three different tiers of achievers in terms of the variables that you have on screen in order to address the overarching question of whether CLIL can truly work with everyone. And from a qualitative stance, we've also identified the main difficulties best practices and chief training needs to cater for diversity through questionnaires, observation, and interview protocols. And we're in the process of designing an app which will allow teachers to take a personalized diagnosis of their main training needs, and they will be redirected to a batch of original materials that we have also designed and piloted. They have what we call differentiation triangulation because they include differentiation on three levels. We start out with an initial phase where we group learners according to ability level. And we cover the same contents, but with differentiated learning objectives according to Bloom's taxonomy. So achievers needing help will only be asked to identify something. Mid-level achievers will be required to perhaps um, analyze or evaluate and high level achievers will be asked to produce. So um, after they have worked in each of these uh, same level groups, they're then in phase two mixed. So we now form mixed ability groups and with different methodologies, which are all student centered, cooperative learning, multiple intelligence theory, task projects, they have to work together towards a common goal. 
And that goal is presented in the third phase through the final product uh, presentation, which also includes differentiation in terms of output, because they can choose whether they want to create an infographic, an interactive presentation, or a video. And um, these, pro these um, materials are project-based, and they're transdisciplinary, because they include English, Spanish, and a minimum of three content subjects. Accompanying the materials is a sort of guidelines manual, which for the first time includes those pedagogical and assessment tips, which we were previously lacking, right? So we very briefly um, illustrate them and provide examples. And we're also taping this month as we speak, what I call CLIL pills. They're kind of, you know, mini TikTok videos, two, three minute videos, where key experts in the field who are part of our project provide clear cut practical solutions to the main challenges that we have identified through our projects. And finally, we've also designed a teacher training course based on all this, and we've piloted at our teacher training center in Cordoba. It has a three pronged structure to guide teachers from more controlled to freer practice. And uh, we've asked teachers in the six participating European countries to record a, a, another two, three minute video sharing their best practices for diversity. And then we get these students to reflect on the differences and similarities. And we've also asked them to read uh, an article from each country, which is also gonna be published in that special issue that I mentioned previously. And we asked them to reflect on how they could productively apply this good practice to their own specific context. So um, the lesson learned here is that we're on it, estamos en ello, and I'll tell you exactly where you can access all of this in the final question, question 15. Let me uh, now at this point offer you a sneak peek, right? Una mirada sin primicia to the results of those projects that I have just been mentioning. Um, in terms of what we can learn from the best practices of others, we have found that carrying out research at the supranational level is extremely beneficial. And our project has included Spain, the UK, Italy, Finland, Austria, and Germany. And we have found that in terms of catering for diversity in CLIL, we can learn from the best practices of others in a way similar to this quote. I don't know if you know this quote, I love it. I use it a lot in my intercultural classes. You know, like your car is German, your vodka is Russian, your pizza is Italian, your coffee is Brazilian, and you complain that your neighbor is an immigrant, pull yourself together. Well, we found that something similar occurs in catering for diversity. If you want to learn about the best lesson planning, you need to look at Finland. Austria is tops for student-centered methodologies. The UK rocks materials design. ICT, uh, sorry, Italy excels at ICT options. And in Spain, we are conspicuous for assessment procedures. So, you know, bottom line, we can learn a great deal from others. So let's keep an, our eye on the supranational perspective. And what exactly have these best practices taught us? For example, in terms of methodological tips, right? Let me furnish you with some guidelines because there are many teachers who ask me, Marisa, how can I integrate latecomers into the program, right? How can I work with heterogeneous classes, which include kids that have been learning CLIL since primary with kids who are just starting out on CLIL in secondary? Well, our project has allowed us to learn from the best practices of others in this sense. And here are the top successful strategies. Um, first, countries like the UK capitalize on interdisciplinary collaboration. So the content subjects should lean on the English subject, which is going to be crucial in helping learners, especially those that have a lower language level, catch up. So they all depart from a diagnostic test of Bix and Kelp, and then they work collaboratively to track progress through a sort of joint progress book. Extramural exposure is also essential because I don't know over there where you guys live, but here in Spain, we dub everything. So we, we have very little exposure to English beyond the classroom. So those learners that have a lower level need a language catch-up in this sense, because research has evinced that the more exposure we have to the language outside the classroom, the better they perform 
in the content subject. So the pedagogical tip here would be to get them to watch YouTube clips as homework, right? They can be on, you know, makeup tutorials or cars, you know, whatever floats their boat, lo que a ellos les guste, but something that's attractive and catchy and that they can watch for maybe 10, 15 minutes every day as homework so that they increase that exposure. Um, a third crucial tip affects materials. These should be transdisciplinary, project-based, and should include tiered level activities for each group of achievers, like the Adibid materials that I mentioned previously. And scaffolding is also absolutely pivotal. Um, with all the techniques that you guys probably know better than me if you're at the grassroots level um, in the classroom. And in line with that scaffolding, our student-centered methodologies. Uh, these have proved to be extremely successful in catering for diversity in our project. For example, using project-based work, task-based language teaching, multiple intelligences, or cooperative learning with all the techniques that it encompasses. And finally, uh, varying groups and learning modalities has also proved very fruitful. For example, using learning stations to create an inclusive atmosphere, uh, same ability groups to provide more personalized attention and extra reinforcement, or mixed ability groups so that they can build on each other's strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. So obviously, you know, as usual, all these strategies are going to entail an increased workload for us teachers. But hey, at least there are quite a few successful tips within our reach. So give them a shot, as we say in real English, try them out. Usadlas, intentadlo. What about for evaluation? What kind of techniques have we found? Have we learned in terms of best practices in other countries? Well, um, in Britain, for example, they don't assess on the same level. They have personalized objectives, which depend on the starting level, and they vary grading criteria to cater for diverse abilities. Uh, rubrics have also proved extremely useful for assessment, together with templates, especially in project-based learning. And of course, building on self and co-assessment is always a good way to go. Our studies have found that ongoing or formative assessment usually works in diversity to a greater extent than summative assessment. And the go-to strategies here include providing detailed guidelines as extra support for the achiever, achievers needing help, also offering more regular and personalized feedback to these types of learners, and adapting activities, both the ones that are done in class and the ones that are assigned for homework. In summative or final assessment, we still have a ways to go in terms of catering for diversity, but a series of techniques have also come to the fore as useful, like highlighting keywords in an exam or adapting its vocabulary, providing different versions for different types of learners, and allowing more time to carry out the exam. So the lesson learned here is that the one-size-fits-all model, el café para todos, as we say in Spanish, it's not going to cut it. It's not going to fit the bill. It's not going to be enough. So we need to diversify our techniques. Let's now move on to two further questions on teacher training, another crucial topic, right? Because teachers feel disempowered in the face of diversity in the CLIL classroom. So how can we train them? Well, the results of our studies have revealed that we need to up our game, right? I guess subir de nivel. We have to do something more. Um, first, we need to depart from relevant needs analysis. We said that the one size fits all model is not gonna cut it in CLIL. So we should carry out an analysis of teacher training needs in our specific context so that we ensure that the decisions we make to respond to truly relevant and real needs, yeah? The analysis we carried out in Europe, in these six European countries, found that the ideal teacher training course would have a three-pronged structure. It would include a little bit of theory, teeny tiny bit, on what diversity and inclusion are, lots of practical training on scaffolding and methodologies and evaluation, right, and um, different types of groupings, and materials. How to access, how to design, how to adapt, how to create. Ideally, tailor-made courses on this would be offered through our teacher training centers or incorporated in our undergraduate degrees. But here in Spain, at least, it's very difficult for a specific course to be incorporated in our grados. So I think our best bet 
is to incorporate this through master's degrees on bilingual education, like the one that we have articulated at the University of Jaén, El Master Interuniversitario en Enseñanza Bilingüe y Aigle, which is 100% online and which follows this three-pronged structure and includes a guidelines to cater for diversity in CLIL programs. And all of this should also be made freely accessible as open educational resources in order to have the greatest outreach possible. So um, the three prong model, TPM, will hopefully help us move from more controlled to freer practice and empower teachers in this sense. But you know what, in addition to this training, we also need to um, you know, help teachers cope with this challenge. We need to do, as we say in real English, a little hand-holding, right, to guide them across the way because they feel truly daunted by the challenge of diversity. And in this sense, I have four main tips. First, knowledge is power. Um, we should know, be aware, be familiar with the materials that we have and the pedagogical tips and the evaluation techniques which are at our disposal in order to step up to the challenge of diversity in CLIL. Second, don't go overwhelming yourselves. Start small. Try out one technique to cater for diversity. See how it works. Then refine, retool, and gradually scale it up. Third, don't go it alone. Seek out support from the multi-tiered systems that we have in place from authorities, parents, language assistants, our colleagues within multi-professional teams. This will make carrying the heavy load just that little bit lighter. And finally, remember it's all about the attitude. You know, CLIL programs like the COVID vaccine have uh, benefits which far outweigh the pitfalls. So it's all about, as we say in real English, having a can-do attitude. Well, you know Dunkin' Donuts, I love Dunkin' Donuts. They've rephrased this as a can-do attitude. Because remember, Research has events that the success of CLIL programs relies more than on any other variable on teachers' commitment and motivation. So it's on us. And you know what? We've set CLIL in motion. What's a little diversity? We got this. Podemos con esto. So uh, lesson learned here. It's on us. Depende de nosotros. So, you know, bring it on. As we say in Spain, a coger el toro por los cuernos. We're very near to the end now, and I wanted to share with you another question, which I think is crucial for us at this point in time, where we have this wave, or more like a tsunami of criticism being leveled at CLIL, and that is whether there is still faith in bilingual education, yeah? And um, we carried out a study with over 2,500 respondents, which unequivocally pointed to a big fat yes as an answer to this question. Teachers felt very self-complacent in their abilities to step up to diversity in terms of language level and scaffolding techniques and student-centered methodologies. Students greatly believed in their teachers' preparation to cater for diversity and parents, parents had blind faith in the teacher, in the methodology, and in the support system set in place to cater for diversity. And interestingly, you know what? In previous studies, only the low socioeconomic status parents had had faith, but now even the high ones firmly believed in uh, bilingual education. So the bottom line here is that CLIL is still regarded as prestigious and worthwhile. There is buy-in from frontline stakeholders like parents who have to decide whether to enroll their children or not in these types of programs. So we need to ensure that um, we involve them, inform them, and empower them to participate in their children's bilingual education. And uh, we're nearing the end. The next to last question before I share with you the resources um, that I've been mentioning throughout this last hour. Um, this 14th question is, as I was saying, very controversial. I wanted to, to throw, it, throw it in there to be a sort of devil's advocate because, you know, we've had to um, move to what we call an emergency online learning scenario due to COVID. And um, online learning has been getting slammed as we say in real English, has been very harshly criticized. And I, you know, I, I wanted to ask, 
has this shift prevented us from catering to diversity? Well, you know me, I'm a firm believer in empirical evidence. So we carried out a study through the Neolaya Alliance, a group of six European universities that we have in Chaim. And um, we explored the affordances and pitfalls of the shift to online learning during COVID. And here are our results. Um, over 500 students told us that, yeah, it's harder to concentrate in online learning. They have a shorter attention span. And there are also issues with um, um, accessibility and connectivity. But this type of learning was regarded as more flexible, safer, and more comfortable. They also acknowledged that online learning entailed a greater workload, sometimes verging on overwhelming, right? As one student said, yo no he trabajado más en toda mi vida de estudiante. But on the upside, they also considered these classes more dynamic, participative, cooperative, and individualized. So diversity was catered for. Uh, when insufficient or untimely feedback was provided online, they sometimes felt they were left to their own devices, but they also considered that this honed a crucial 21st century soft skill, which is learner autonomy. And finally, Although this kind of teaching can sometimes be considered a little bit colder because there's a lack of personal touch, they also acknowledged that teachers were available, flexible, adaptable, understanding, invested, and committed in the online learning experience. So you know what? This got me reflecting on this quote that I read in an interview recently, which said that, you know, new technologies might generate opportunities to make learning memorable, but the essence of teaching is in face-to-face -face interaction. And before the COVID experience and before my own experience in, of over 10 years teaching in 100% online masters, I think I probably would have agreed with this. But now, now I'm not so sure because you know what? I have found in my online teaching that I can employ the exact same student-centered methodologies as when I teach face-to-face. -face. Uh, for example, I use cooperative learning a lot with the jigsaw procedure. I can do this just as successfully in the forum, breaking my students down into groups and in the Zoom breakout rooms. Works beautifully. Second, I can actually create the exact same kind of report as in face-to-face -face teaching. In fact, I think I'm more in touch with my students than when I used to see them you know, twice a week in person. Um, now I'm in constant contact with them through the um, online um, tutorials, you know, group tutorials that we have, or through synchronous webinars, or through the forum, or via email. And finally, I can monitor their work actually much more closely because everything that they upload or they post is saved for my subsequent supervision. So I can provide with very, I can, you know, provide very individualized attention, right, and have a, a clear monitoring of their uh, development. So you know what? If all the ingredients, the right ingredients are thrown into the mix, online teaching can be a success story. So I just wanted to throw that in there and be a little bit of a devil's advocate. And final question, from everything we've been mentioning, how can we make it all available to the broader educational community? Where can you find any of this in case you're interested? Well, first, the um, questionnaires and the interview and observation protocols that we've designed and the materials that integrate diversity into their DNA uh, will be made freely available as open educational resources. Yeah, so you can download them straight off our webpage. Um, we've also designed a, a Powtoon, which summarizes the basics of our project, which you can find on our webpage and also on our social media. And there you'll also be able to access Leaflex with the key information on the projects. Uh, the Adibe app, which I mentioned previously for that personalized diagnosis will be available very, very shortly. And uh, the CLIL pills, the online pedagogical video guides are being uh, taped as we speak this month with uh, key figures that you've got on screen, as you can see from uh, universities in Finland, Italy, Germany, Austria, or um, Scotland. And all of this will be made freely available on our webpage, which is adibeproject.com, and also on our social media. We are on uh, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. So if you're interested in, in any of this, stay tuned, al loro, as we say in Spanish, because lots of fresh stuff is coming.
Okay, so let's wrap it up, shall we? Let's extract the, I would say, the five key takeaways from uh, this talk that I wanted to share with you as a final wrap up. We've been uh, answering and addressing three overarching objectives, seven specific goals, and 15 frequently asked questions. So, you know, not too shabby, huh? As we say in real English. No está nada mal para una hora. I hope to have provided you lots of food for thought to ensure diversity, inclusion, and well-being of all types of learners into our CLIL classrooms. And the five main ideas I would like you to walk away with are the following. First, as Taylor Swift aptly said in one of her songs, haters gonna hate, 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 yeah? Uh, but as she said in that very same song, we need to shake it off, right? And ensure that we overcome el fenómeno del cuñadismo with hardcore empirical research. And that we quit harping on the elitism segregation issue, which is on its way out, and focus instead on setting in place measures to cater for diversity and ensure that CLIL works equally well with over and under achievers alike. Secondly, let me just take a minute to take out my Spanish pride. Spain is very conspicuous on the CLIL diversity map. We have one of the most inclusive systems in Europe and hence in the world right now. So, you know, learn from us, especially from our mistakes so that you don't make them because we're all on the same boat. Third, remember, CLIL provision as it stands does not fit the bill. We're gonna to have to rethink and re-engineer our programs to ensure that mainstreaming works. So they're gonna require a thorough overhaul, right? As Henry Ford said, if you always do what you've always done, you will always get what you've always got. So at this point, we need to uh, shake things up, right? Hacerle un lavado de cara a esto. And we need to update, upgrade, and upscale what we're doing. We need to update our English as we've been doing throughout this talk as well, right? To make it more fresh. Uh, more relevant, more recent. Second, we need to upgrade our materials to ensure that we um, work in diversity into their very DNA. And third, we need to upscale our methodologies so that what we do is more um, interactive, dynamic, and impactful. And um, the way forward in doing all this lies, as I hope to have showcased here, in learning from the best practices of others, right? We're all gonna walk down the same path at some point or another. So it's very useful to keep our eye, as we said, on the supranational perspective. And finally, when the going gets tough, which it will, remember, the tough get going. And we have to be aware of the fact, as we saw here today, that there is still faith in bilingual education. And this is compounded with the fact that we now have experience and instruments and commitment and motivation and empirical evidence to keep this show on the road, yeah? So on that exciting road that we still have ahead towards diversity in bilingual education, well, people, you know what? I'm not gonna lie. The road is not gonna look like this, okay? You know, straight out into the horizon without any obstacles or hurdles, no, 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 no. Sometimes it's gonna look like this, it's gonna be a hot mess. Most of the time, it'll probably be like this, you know, with its twists and turns and ups and downs, which will make the journey all the more exciting, yeah? So on that road that we still have up ahead, that's us, yeah? Remember that we've got what it takes, the faith and the instruments and the evidence, as we say in real English, to kill it, crush it, or slay it. Para abordarlo, para triunfar. So own it. Pisad fuerte, because you know what? CLIL is on track. It's as if we've got the vaccine for the virus. All we're going to need now are the booster shots, las inyecciones de refuerzo, to act against the new strains, the new challenges, which CLIL will inevitably continue to throw our way and which indicate that luckily bilingual education is still very much alive. I hope that our paths down that road meet again, either in person or virtually, very soon. And until then, I remain at your entire disposal for any questions which you might have now or in the future. Thank you so much. It's been so lit to work with you. Un abrazo desde España.